Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, I apologize for being away for some time. I had to travel across the country for a sick and dying relative, and we all know that family comes first. So I'm going to go ahead and try to make it up by doing five updates in a row here for the next five days to try to catch up with all the things that I missed. So we're going to start out with a chart of the SSE composite. This is the Chinese stock market index. If you remember, I talked about how, um, well, I talked quite a while ago, uh, back around 2000 uh, points here, where if you could buy this index using Chinese currency, you'd obviously become very, very rich because the index is going to appreciate tremendously as well as the currency it's denominated in. So it's just a no brainer, it, but it was very difficult, still is very difficult to do that because it's not a freely floated currency. There are ways through uh, Singapore and through Hong Kong, but really only the rich can participate. Frankly, with the uh, promise of physical silver, I, I didn't do it myself. Uh, if I were rich, I would have, but um, I'd rather just put my money in silver. It probably has a better uh, long-term prospect. But anyway, you can see that it uh, corrected from that. I said there'd probably be a correction, but you can see how it just blasted off almost a thousand points. Now, you know, looking at the long-term picture, you can see it's just a breakout from a really uh, a long-term base consolidation. So like I said before, it could easily run to 50,000. That wouldn't surprise me. It's just starting. And I think it's going to go, you know, probably probably be 8,000 by next year. We'll see. Uh, but let's get over to silver. Um, uh, there's a lot of articles about the 350 million ounces supposedly that JP Morgan is accumulating and what that means. We're going to go and look at one of the uh, Steve St. Angelo articles. Now we can draw these trend lines in a number of ways. I've drawn them myself. You can see the first one. It, it's violated right there on the first rally. That's a real crystal clear line. Um, you can also draw one in here to pull in the next one. And that's also really crystal clear because you can see you pick that top there and you get the bottom and it rallies. You pick the top and you get the bottom and it rallies again. Now we're in a sideways motion. If we draw it again, uh, the one, the chart that's on uh, Steve St. Angelo's site actually draws it from this. And, you know, it's, it's more of an art than a science. So, you know, you really can't say that one I think is drawn something like that. It, is it a turnaround? Well, yeah, I think it is a turnaround, but it, it's it's a slow turnaround. And we'll, we'll look at what that um, 350 million ounces might be when we speculate about that. But let's get to the main story of the night. We're going to start out with this interview with Bix Weir on Elijah's uh, channel. And the reason why I want to talk about that is because of all of the discussion, and I've, I've taken a very long time uh, to decide to address this issue. And I, I'm going to go ahead and address it tonight. It's on Jews, and, you know, it's kind of like the elephant in the room that no one talks about, but everyone talks about. But uh, let's listen to Bix Weir here. He's going to tell us about stuff we kind of already know and some stuff we didn't really know, and and uh, we'll let this play, and then I'll comment that when you think about who runs these financial systems who runs the the, the u.s government uh, treasury is run by jack lou jack lou is a devout jewish um of devout jewish faith you go to christine lagarde same thing she gave a speech about the magic number seven uh, a couple years ago she is a devout jewish uh religious believer and you go down to the head of the fed the head of everybody and you know I did a uh, I did a little analysis of how many people practice the Jewish faith who lead the financial system. And it's almost every single person. I think the only really big name that isn't Jewish or claims not to be Jewish is is Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan. Um, his wife is Jewish. His kids are Jewish. And and Sandy Weil, the old uh, head of Citibank, asked him to convert to Judaism before they did the you know the merging of of Bank One and Citibank and J.P. Morgan and all that, and Jamie Dimon said no, but I'll you know I'll do everything else, but I won't convert. So you know it gets back to 
you know, who really runs the system and, and on what schedule are they running it? Because if you go back to the last four or five Shemitahs, you know, 2000. Okay, so this is this Shemitah issue, and I haven't really addressed that either. Now, as a uh, Grace Age Gentile Bible believing Christian, I don't put a lot of stock into um, Jewish prophecies because I don't really think they're. Uh, we're not in that type of time frame. I'm not going to go way into that discussion. That's a huge theological debate that could go on for literally days. But uh, I'm, just to let you know, that's my opinion on that. Now, could something happen? Yes, something could happen. And people have said um, it might be because the Shemitah is true, although I don't think it is. Or it could be because a lot of people who believe it's true make it so. Um, we just don't know. Now, if you look at the dates, they definitely are significant. Um, you can see that 2008, we know that was a financial crisis. We know that uh, 2001 was a big crash after 911. Um, 1994 is kind of sketchy. That's kind of what a bond market crash. But 1987, that one was the big one as far as a stock market crash. You've got uh, 1980 was the gold and silver market top and the interest rate top as well. So, uh, and then 73, a big stock market, uh, bear market. So there definitely seems to be something there. But again, at the same time, it's kind of like the Martin Armstrong uh, stuff. It's kind of like the Elliott Wave stuff. Um, you can kind of find something everywhere you look if you look close enough. So uh, I don't want to attach too much importance to it, but I don't want to dismiss it as well. It, there's some significance there, and others have talked about Jade Helm and things like that. And so maybe something's going to happen uh, in September of this year. My contrarian nature tells me probably not, that uh, there'll be a big, huge expectation for it to happen, and then nothing happens. Or maybe some giant rally in everything happens. So uh, that would not surprise me at all. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is this uh, on Jews. And it, Bix is very clear here. Um, now, this isn't secret information. This is information that's talked about all across the web. In fact, it's talked about every day. Uh, the Flat Earth stuff that I did recently, you can go through the comments on those, and there are a ton of rants about the Zionists, the Jews, the Khazars, the people that run everything and they control the entire world and the goyim and they're subject to this so um the reason why i think that this is important is because you have to just kind of use a common sense approach to this now there's no denying that the number of bankers the number of treasury secretary uh secretaries the number of uh financial advisors the number of um federal reserve heads yelling Bernanke, Greenspan, there's no question that the representation of Jews in these groups are cannot be accounted for by random chance. I, don't, I can't tell you what the percentage of the population is. I think blacks are 10%, maybe Jews are 2 or 3%. Don't quote me on I'm just guessing. But uh, we can definitely say that their representation in these areas are uh, could, no, could in no way... Uh, be accounted for by random chance. There's absolutely no way that that's possible. So there's a tremendous overrepresentation of Jews in the financial area, in government specifically. Now the big question is why? And we know that the Jews are blamed on a consistent basis in the comments of these videos. I could probably go down, scroll down to the comments here and see huge rants about the Zionists. Here we go. Uh, you know, I'm not even going to go into it. If, if if you are not aware of that, then you've been sleeping under a rock someplace. So the question I have and what I've always brought up is this. If this group of people who are very, very tiny as far as percentage-wise are so powerful wouldn't you think that a group that is so powerful that they rule the entire world would be able to do it in secret? 
Isn't that something you would think that that group would be able to do? And, and by the way, the other accusation that this group, uh, the other accusation is that this group completely controls the media. They utterly have it on the lockdown. So if this group completely controlled the media, wouldn't you think they would have the ability to keep their name out of the media? Let me give you an analogy. We, we hear about uh, people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates nonstop. If you go to uh, Yahoo Finance, there's literally a daily story on Warren Buffett. I'm not kidding you. Now, how rich is Warren Buffett? Well, um, supposedly he's worth 50, 60, 70, 80 billion. I don't know. It, it comes and goes. Same with Bill Gates. But when do you ever see a story on the Rockefellers? When do you ever see a story on the Astors or all of the, go and pull up the uh, Fritz Springmeier 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati and all those famous families that have tremendous wealth. Where do you ever see their names in the media? You don't. You see these lackeys like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, the guys from Google, the fraud, Elon Musk. These are the people that you see in the media. So I would suggest to you that if you see somebody or some group constantly in the media, these people are not the real power. These people are either puppets or scapegoats. Now, let me give you an example here. This is a group that I would like to know why they're never in the media. So you tell me. Here's one article. The wealth of the Roman Catholic Church is impossible to calculate. The Roman Catholic Church's wealth is impossible to calculate, is impossible. In truth, the church itself likely could not answer that question even if it wished to. Its investments and spending are kept secret. Its real estate and art have not been properly evaluated since the church would never sell them. There is no doubt, however, that between the church's priceless art, land, and gold, and investments across the globe, it is one of the wealthiest institutions on earth. Since 1313 AD, when Catholicism became the official religion of the Roman Empire, its power has been in near constant growth. The church was able to acquire land, most notably the papal states surrounding Rome, convert pagan temples and claim relics for itself. Over 300 years, it became one of Europe's largest landowners. For the next thousand years, tithes and tributes flowed in from all over Europe. Non-Christians and even fellow Christians, that would be us Protestants, were killed and their property confiscated. And by the way, when I say us Protestants, it doesn't mean that I agree with the Protestant, it just means that I agree with uh, the disagreement with Rome. For example, the Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople in the early 13th century brought it gold, money, and jewels. Now let's look at this article here. The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power on earth. Have you ever wondered how wealthy the church really is? In his book, The Vatican Billions, writer and philosopher, Avro Manhattan gives us a glimpse of the true financial worth of the Catholic Church. The Vatican has large investments with the Rothschilds of Britain, France, and America, and with Hambrose Bank, with Credit Suisse in London and Zurich. In the United States, it has large investments with Morgan Bank, Chase Manhattan Bank, First National Bank, New York. Now, these have all changed, uh, of course, but all bailed out. Bankers Trust and others. The Vatican has billions of shares, billions of shares. Think about that. Shares are in the hundreds. Uh, so we're talking trillions in the most powerful international corporations such as Gulf Oil, Shell, General Motors, Bethlehem Steel, General Electric, International Business Machines, TWA. Some idea of the real estate and other forms of wealth controlled by the Catholic Church may be gathered by the remark of a member of the New York Catholic Conference, namely, quote, that his church probably ranks second only to the United States government in total annual purchase. Another statement made by a nationally syndicated Catholic priest perhaps is even more telling. Quote, the Catholic Church, he said, must be the biggest corporation in the United States. We have a branch office in every neighborhood 
our assets and real estate holdings must exceed those of Standard Oil, AT&T, and U.S. Steel combined, and our roster of dues-paying members must be second only to the tax rolls of the United States government. Now, I'm not even going to go into the City of London and the Social Security Administration and the payments to Rome and the deep conspiracy theories on this because uh, it just goes too deep. Let's look at one more here. The Vatican Billions. This is the uh, book that was quoted, and this is very interesting. Here's a quote from the Gospel. This is Christ. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now let's just think about this. Jesus, the founder of Christianity, was the poorest of the poor. Yes, that's God himself incarnate. He didn't have a place to rest his head. Roman Catholicism, which claims to be his church, is the richest of the rich, the wealthiest institution on earth. How come that such an institution ruling in the name of this same itinerant preacher whose want was such that he had not even a pillow upon which to rest his head is now so top-heavy with riches that she can rival indeed that she can put to shame the combined might of the most redoubtable financial trusts of the most potent industrial supergiants and of the most prosperous global corporations of the world. It is a question that has echoed along the somber corridors of history during almost 2,000 years, a question that has puzzled, bewildered, and angered in turn untold multitudes from the first centuries to our days. The startling contradiction of the tremendous riches of the Roman Catholic Church with the direct teachings of Christ concerning their unambiguous rejection is too glaring to be passed by tolerated or ignored by even the most indifferent of believers. In the past, indeed, some of the most virulent fulminations against such mnemonic accumulation came from individuals whose zeal and religious fervor were second to none. Their denunciations of the wealth, the pomp, the luxury, and the worldly habits of abbots, bishops, cardinals, and popes can still be heard thundering with unabated clamor at the opening of almost any page of the checkered annals of Western history. But while it was to their credit that such men had the honesty to denounce the very church to which they had dedicated their lives, it is also to the latter's discredit that she took no heed of the voices of anguish and anger of those of her sons who had taken the teachings of the gospel to the letter, and therefore were eager that the Roman Catholic system, which claimed to be the true bride of Christ, be as poor as one she called master. When she did not silence them, she ignored them, or at the most considered them utterances of religious innocence to be tolerated as long as her revenue was not made to suffer. And you can see it's a very, very long book, it goes through all of the machinations and uh, horrible, horrible uh, acts of the Roman Catholic Church. And um, I don't have time to go through that. You could literally spend your lifetime going through that. But here's the question. Why is it that the Jews are always in the news? The Jews are always in the comments. The Zionists are always being spoken of, but we never hear about the Vatican. We never hear about the Jesuits. We never hear about the Papists. Why is that? Well, I think you know why that is. Because they're the real power. And what I'm going to suggest here is that if you study history, you'll find that uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church when it has had the power to, it has persecuted true Christians. That would be those of the non-Catholic, I'm not going to use Protestant, but non-Catholic uh, denominations and Jews uh, put them to death, taken their lands. Um, that is what she plans to do again. So it's not surprising at all that in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, that the Vatican is preparing the stage again for the Jews to be blamed for a financial catastrophe. A financial catastrophe 
the likes of which the world has never seen. We're talking about a reneging on all debts. Uh, they're going to be electronic, the vast majority of them. We're going to see a reneging on all debts, a questioning of all assets. And when that happens, uh, they're obviously preparing for rioting in the streets, but also they've already prepared their scapegoats. And I think it's very clear that they're going to blame the Jews. And we'll talk to you next time.